Hi everyone, welcome to Women's Health Week, Australia's biggest week in women's health. I'm your host, Adriana Candelo. Um, I am a mother of three beautiful children. I've got twins, Leo and Olivia, who are four, and I have an almost two-year-old daughter called Zoe. Um, I am mostly a stay-at-home mum, but I also run my own bookkeeping business. Um, and I live here in this beautiful lockdown Melbourne with my husband and my little family. Um, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis uh, 10 years ago when I was 26 years old. And over the years, I have done a lot of fundraising for MS and MS research um, with my family helping me to raise almost $300,000 over the years. Um, I also work as an ambassador to help support those living with multiple sclerosis um, with, and, and to help create awareness into the disease. I am so honoured and thrilled to be a part of Women's Health Week this year and, and host our incredible guest speakers today. On behalf of MS Australia and MS Limited, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are in Australia. In the spirit of reconciliation, MS Limited and MS Australia acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection, connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Today's event is all about the latest research on fertility, pregnancy and MS. And to tell us more, we've invited three guest speakers in the research space. We've got Susan Aglin, Vilia Jokovides and Jeanette Le Lechner-Scott. First up speaking will be Susan on infertility and MS research. Now, this topic of infertility is something that resonates with me greatly. Um, my husband and I were faced with many challenges while trying to start our family from MS and also uh, other fertility issues. Um, at the time, I was advised to stop my medication before trying for a baby, as at that time, they did not know what the effects of medications could have on fertility or the baby. Um, so I was off my medication for almost three years. And in that time, I unfortunately had four miscarriages before undergoing IVF and then being blessed with my miracle twins. Uh, my fertilities were unrelated to MS. However, my fears were my fear was that because I had MS and I was, wasn't on any medication or support, the stress of all the pregnancy losses and IVF, um, you know, would, I, was, I was scared that it would cause me to relapse and become unwell. Uh, I also had the same fears during my pregnancy as I was unsure how being pregnant would affect my symptoms or my progression with MS. MS research is fundamental and is key to our futures living with MS. To me, MS research represents hope into the unknown and to know that research is being undertaken into issues surrounding fertility and pregnancy is such an encouraging way forward for those living with MS. Susan is a conjoint fellow at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Newcastle. She is an experienced clinical nurse in the MS research space with a history of working in the hospital and healthcare industry. And now I'm going to pass it over to Susan. Um, can't wait to hear your, hear your talk today. Thank you, Adriana. That's a lovely introduction. Um, uh, I'm so pleased to be invited to speak today. Um, by no means am I an expert in fertility, um, but it's an absolute privilege to present to the population that I closely work with and who drive the research interests that we have. Um, I'd like to just say also if this presentation or any of the talks today causes you any worry or distress, I strongly um, encourage you to talk to your MS nurse or your neurologist or your GP. If you're watching this presentation and they're not sure or, or suspect that you might have some fertility issues, I, I think we'd all recommend that you seek advice sooner rather than later from your primary caregiver. And so here we go. I'm going to briefly outline what subfertility is the effect that it has on MS and how you might how MS affects fertility, how you might manage subfertility, and then propose an argument or two for doing more research in this area. It's an overview only, given the short amount of time that we have today. I'm sure that MS Connect or your MS nurse, neurologist or GP can provide you with more information. So I love this picture. Analogies are something that I use a lot when talking um, to people with MS um, at home, anyone who listens to me when I get on my soapbox about anything. 
Um, I accidentally came across this picture, but it means quite a lot. The, the photo itself is a little bit um, unclear, but you might be able to see a person walking up a hill and they're using um, uh, hiking sticks, which have been you know, recently more popular with people that need aids to walk. I absolutely love this picture and it's the analogy of walking, somebody walking through a journey. The obvious symbolism is, is that they're walking alone, they're walking uphill and they need aids. They're walking under dark clouds and they have no idea about what's coming at the top of that hill. The truth is rarely that dark, although it might feel like it. You have family, you have friends, you have years of experience coping with challenges and difficult times and different health issues. You are not without resources. When it comes to MS, you have your MS team, and sometimes we are walking beside you, sometimes we're ahead of you to say, hey, look, we know that ahead of things is easier or more difficult, but we're here with you. And my favourite part is when we're eventually behind you, maybe where the photographer is standing just out of reach, we can see where you are, we're right here if you need to turn around and say, help. My experience with subfertility and MS, however, in walking this journey is perhaps not having the same tools or the same knowledge as I usually would. Um, my patients or our patients will set off to start a family. They might have fertility issues, but they go into this void. They go off MS treatment, then they come back if they relapse. Some of them end up with a baby and some don't. Some end up with more relapses or a recurrence of old symptoms that they might not have had otherwise. So what is this thing we call subfertility? Um, if fertility is the ability to become pregnant and infertility is the inability to become pregnant, then subfertility is the experience of difficulty becoming pregnant. The medical dictionary um, term for it or explanation is any form of reduced fertility with prolonged time of unwanted non-conception. Some healthcare professionals like your GP might define it as no pregnancy within 12 months of trying and that's often diagnosed at the end of that 12 months. Rarely do we have any idea at the beginning that you might have difficulties. The causes of subfertility are complex, they're multi, they're, they're um, um, male and female driven. Some of the issues can be broken down into straight ovulation issues. You might have uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. You might have a diminished ovarian reserve. Um, it can be problems with the hypothalamus and pituitary, which ro roll out that um, hormonal pathway for fertility. You might have problems with a fallopian tube. You might have endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease. You might have a uh, history of an STD, sexually transmitted um, infection that can cause infertility. Sometimes further down the line there are uterine abnormalities. You might have fibroids or septate uterus, bicornate uterus, etc. And then if we flip over to the um, male side of things there can be function problems with sperm production. Again sexually transmitted diseases can cause infertility in males as well as females. Diabetes, Cancers and some cancer treatments can cause problems with sperm production. And of course, there are other things like genetic defects. Um, if we go further down the line with the man, sperm delivery dysfunction is also a key contributor to infertility. Um, things like cystic fibrosis, premature ejaculation and blockages. Um, they're just the things outside of MS. They're just the things that can contribute towards um, subfertility. But if you add MS into the mix, we've got even more layers of complexity. So in MS, we talk about sexual dysfunction as caused by um, MS. And there are three um, categories. The primary sexual dysfunction that is caused directly by central nervous system damage. For example, in women, you can have decreased se sexual sensation, um, which makes um, intercourse painful and difficult. And for males, you can have erectile dysfunction. Secondary sexual dysfunction um, results from those primary functional problems. For example, difficulties with mobility or having increased spasms, which can make getting into sexual positions or prolonged activity difficult and fatigue would fit under this category. Um, tertiary sexual dysfunction comes as a result of both those primary and sexual problems, secondary sexual problems. And they can be things like change in mood, um, uh, cognition changes. And if you think a little bit wider, changes within the role within the intimate 
partnership. If someone becomes more of a carer than they are, um, than they are of intimate partners, that can really decrease the interest in sexual relationships. Adding even more complexity and um, things that we should think about when we're talking about subfertility is these things. So there are no or very few personal predictive flags to begin early treatment for subfertility. This is important because if we actually had any idea that we, we were um, uh, subfertile, you could begin treatments early and increase significantly increase your chances of ending up with a successful pregnancy. There are other things that I kind of lump under cultural reasons, cultural hesitancies, because there are reasons why personalities and cultural reasons why women or families are less comfortable talking about sex and fertility. Um, your carer also falls under that category because it's not always comfortable for your clinician to talk about um, sexual function as well. I, that sort of throws me usually because um, we are always assessing your bladder function and your bowel function, but sometimes some clinicians don't quite get to talking about, so how's the sexual function going? Um, other layers of complexity include relationships that are same sex um, or single parent families that want to have more babies. They have to outsource some of that function that adds another layer of complexity. Not to mention the cost of fertility procedures. Um, many of them aren't covered by Medicare or completely covered by insurance. And so if we're thinking about a population of people who are already disadvantaged economically, um, adding significant costs to becoming pregnant is, is sometimes outside that scope of that, for, that, for that family. Each of these things could be a presentation in their own right, but we're just touching on them today. So of those things that are known risk factors for subfertility, there are, there are a group of things. Uh, so increasing age is one of them. Females over 35 and males over 40 years of age are uh, less likely or more likely to have, sub, have, have subfertility, have difficulty getting pregnant. We know that women in their 20s have a 30% chance of getting pregnant at each month. And then fertility starts generally to reduce um, beyond your 30s. And by the time you're 40, the chance of getting pregnant in any given month is only around 5%. Male fertility starts to reduce about the age of 40 or 45 years. And that's the time when sperm quality tends to decrease. If we move that conversation now towards artificial reproductive technologies, we know, and it's a bit of a furphy that um, IVF, um, in vitro fertilisation can fix all problems. In women's increasing age also reduces significantly the chance of successful IVF cycles. If you're in your early 30s, you have a 43% chance of having a successful pregnancy. But by the time you've hit your early 40s, that drops to only 11%. Other known risk factors that we have for subfertility include being over or underweight, smoking, which includes smoking tobacco and marijuana. Smoking in MS is bad in any case. Um, I think if we move to the next um, point of chronic stress being contributed to subfertility, it's a bit of a it's a it's a bit of an oxymoron. Um, people find smoking difficult to, to stop when they're feeling really stressed out. And so it's a really difficult situation that people find themselves in. You have to find yourself a healthy vice to replace the smoking tobacco. Um, radiation exposure, not the sort of radiation you would get from a routine x-ray, but certainly big doses of radiotherapy, for example, when you have a cancer treatment will decrease your chances of getting pregnant. Um, some medications that have side effects that might affect the hormonal pathway responsible for fertility. And certainly there are some recreational drugs that will reduce fertility. So marijuana will reduce uh, sperm count, for example. Um, there are environmental toxins, chemicals, metals, and air pollutants. For example, some organophosphate pesticides and herbicides, the sort of things that are used in pest control in crops and farmers and vets who might be involved in cattle and sheep dipping will reduce fertility. And then slightly further down the page, I talk about, um, I lump everything under this heading of social contributor to, to subfertility. It's this growing trend, um, especially in Western society for delaying pregnancies. Um, if you look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics data, 
from the last 40 years. Um, my, when I was born, just a mere 48 years ago, uh, my mother and father were at the median age of becoming first time parents. My mother was 25 and my father was 48, 48, 28. Come forward to nowadays, the latest data shows that the average age of parents having their first children for women is 31 years and for men it's 33 years. Less, less relevant to this discussion but still topical is that the fertility rate overall is also reducing. So again, back when I was a baby, women and families were having over two children, nearly two and a half children per family. Um, nowadays, it's just over 1.6 per family. So we've talked a lot about risk and there's risk with not just fertility, but also with MS. So if we're thinking about people having to consider fertility treatments, you've got an increased risk of relapse um, or disease progression while you're off treatment. So people who, when they're newly diagnosed, think that they would like to straight away um, delay going onto a treatment and starting to have a baby, well, they've got this increased risk of relapsing during that time. And people who think that they might take a treatment holiday or a break um, down the track will also be increasing their risk of relapse. There are also some treatment specific risk. So for example, um, Jelenia, uh, only 10% of people on Jelenia and an even less number of people on Tysabri may experience this thing called a rebound. So it's a little bit like a rubber band. When you stop treatment, disease doesn't just slowly come back, it rebounds like letting go of a rubber band. Um, some fertility treatments we think may also increase the risk of relapse if you're having artificial reproductive technologies like IVF or IUI, which we'll talk about later on. That process of giving yourself hormonal injections to stimulate the ovaries to produce the eggs um, may increase your risk for relapse. Unfortunately, there are case reports that report this and small studies. So although we have some data. One of the problems with that data that we have is that they are largely case reports, so they're very small studies. They are done overseas, and so they're using different protocols of um, um, artificial reproductive technologies. And so that information may not actually be terribly generalizable or usable to the MS population in Australia. In the research world, that's what we call a gap in the literature. So we talked about the risk, we've done all the Nelly, negative Nelly stuff. Now it's time to flip uh, this conversation over and we'll talk about taking control. What can we do about subfertility? Well, immediately there's things that you can be doing. So you can be um, thinking about those lifestyle choices like reducing or stopping smoking, reducing or stopping alcohol consumption, working towards getting into a healthy weight and managing that chronic stress. Then there's things that we can help more with in managing those primary and secondary and tertiary um, reasons for MS related dis dysfunction. And then there's things that we definitely can't help but help refer you on for, and that's assessment of ovulation and sperm health. That would start with your GP, and they may be able to get the process of um, assessments underway that you probably then need to um, meet up with a fertility expert at some point in time, who will then talk about fertility, um, drugs, surgical options, and those intrauterine insemination and in, in vitro fertilization options. Again, at the bottom of the page, I just wanna draw your attention to that model of MS care. So we've talked about things that you can do and things that, that we can, um, as clinic health professionals can help you with, but I really do believe that our model of MS care now that most MS centres and most neurologists around the country are using really can help towards the journey of pregnancy planning. For example, we are diagnosing people early, we're starting treatment early and we're getting good disease control. So that means we can really nicely plan treatment pauses and safely plan treatment pauses for um, conception. Having regular follow-ups and regularly monitoring your disease means that we can pick up changes early. We can plan um, switches to treatments that might be more safe in pregnancy or in breastfeeding um, are important. Having conversations with people that are diagnosed about family planning in the context of building their MS management plan. So for example, we might be diagnosing a 19 year old, but we probably will slip into the conversation hey, we know you're probably not ready yet, but what, what, what's your plans for your family? What 
do you want to have babies? Is, is, do you have a partner at the, even at this point in time? What are your expectations? And then having that conversation again and again throughout their journey of, through their fertility years. Also, we will diagnose people when they're in the middle of having their families. And so that management plan needs to incorporate discussions about, have you finished having babies? Do we want to continue here? That will really affect that management plan. What's really important is keeping the person with MS at the centre of that management plan because that keeps their life goals front and centre, improves your quality of life, includes adapting to have a chronic disease, making MS a part of who you are, not wholly focused on what you are. So do you remember that walking the journey analogy that we had right at the very beginning? We as clinicians and researchers use the data derived from research as one of the tools to be able to develop best practice to tell you what's up ahead on the path, over that hill, for example. In Australia, there is no clinical guideline or health pathway to inform healthcare choices in some fertility and MS. As a result, what we find as clinicians is that care is really haphazard at best. We hope that the person is going to get pregnant in a really short space of time or that they don't relapse. It's really crossing fingers, crossing toes and hoping that we don't see them soon. Communication between fertility experts and neurologists and other healthcare professionals is typically quite poor. And man medical management plans kind of overlap and they're not particularly evidence-based. And an example of that I have is people, Women with MS, when they're pregnant, are often labelled as risky pregnancies and they're offered very early up elective caesarean sections. And there's no evidence that vaginal deliveries cause relapse. There's no, but there is evidence that anaesthetics will increase the risk of relapse. Not also to forget that caesarean sections are a major surgery and recovery from that will take weeks and will definitely impact MS. Less important, but um, still important to mention at this point is that MS, in, when someone's undergoing fertility treatment, MS takes a back seat. It means that the opportunities to manage new symptoms or even monitor, just simply monitoring MS may be lost. And so we really don't know what's going on in the background there. Super important that we keep doing research in this field to develop the knowledge to help Australian women and Australian families to hit their personal goals. Shortly, Billy is going to take over this conversation and talk about the current known data, including MS-based data, which a lot of Australians have contributed data to. After that, Jeanette's going to talk about and expand on research projects that are in planning that will improve our understanding of fertility and pregnancy in MS in Australia. I'm confident that by better understanding the path that Australian women experience subfertility, we can improve the journey of walking with you. And so now we're at the end. I hope you can forgive my not so subtle fertility images. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you found this presentation helpful in laying out the current landscape of subfertility and MS. And now I'd like to hand over to Vilia. Thank you, Susan. Um, that was just, just such a great representation of, you know, people looking at getting into starting a family and, um, you know, going over the issues of subfertility. It's such a great insight. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for your talk. I'm sure many people be, you know, thoroughly, um, they would have got that insight from you and it's a first step, which is really good. Um, I'd just like to say to everyone, if you've got any questions today, please um, feel free to type them in the question sections of the control panel and one of our team will follow up with answers across the week. Today, our second speaker is Dr. Vilia Yokobaitis who will be covering pregnancy and MS research. Vilia is a senior research fellow in the Department of Neuroscience at the Center, at Central Clinical School at Monash University. Vilia is a clinical and tra translational neuroscientist with skills in molecular medicine and biostatistics. Biostatistics, sorry, that's a hard one for me to say. The aim of her research is to inform better patient management and treatment individualization strategies for people with MS with a particular focus on women's health and pregnancy. So off to you, Vilia. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Adriana. And also thank you to Susan for that really nice um, segue into what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I also have my Twitter and my email, so if anybody um, wanted to get in touch and ask any questions, you can also contact me there. 
so as alluded to already, um, I do a lot of research using a database called MS Base or the MS Base Registry. Um, and so what this is, it's an international registry of people with multiple sclerosis who have kindly allowed us to analyse their anonymised data. So what happens is that people with MS, they go and they see their neurologist and the neurologist records all sorts of information about them. And some of that information might include things such as their um, gender, their date of birth, what sort of MS they have, but also they measure um, disability, relapse information, treatment information, um, as well as pregnancy information. And I have the privilege of being the co-chair and scientific leader of a subcommittee within um, the MS Base Registry, specifically looking at pregnancy, neonatal outcomes and women's health. And um, as Susan also said, a lot of Australians do contribute to this registry. And I just had a quick look while Susan was talking. And it turns out we have almost 10,000 Australians with MS who are currently contributing data to our registry. So that's about 40% of all Australians with multiple sclerosis are currently contributing to this, which is a huge um, undertaking. Um, okay. So, um, I've also had the privilege of being part of a group where using the um, research that we are um, putting together, we've actually been asked to put together some consensus statements around pregnancy um, based on the research and the evidence that we're creating. And so today I thought that I would talk about three broad topics. Um, firstly, looking at MS and pregnancy considerations, postpartum considerations, as well as looking at the long-term impact of pregnancy on MS. So let's have a look at some of the guidelines that we've um, put together. And so these are things that we think that everybody with MS should know, and we think that all clinicians should know about, and should really um, help frame some of the discussions that you're having. Um, and so by sharing these with you, hopefully this might also trigger some um, things that you might wanna discuss with your clinician if you're thinking about um, pregnancy. So the first thing that we would like to highlight, and I think Susan already touched on this as well, is that all women of childbearing age should have pre-pregnancy counselling, um, ideally early on um, following an MS diagnosis. And that you should really um, discuss, if you do decide to have a pregnancy, do discuss this with your MS clinical team, your nurse, your neurologist, before trying to conceive, because there are a lot of considerations that are specific to MS. Now, one of the things that you should know is that um, women with MS may actually have reduced rates of relapses during their pregnancy, but that relapses might rebound. So as Susan alluded to, that elastic band analogy um, after they deliver their baby. So in the three months postpartum. And so how do we know this? Well, originally and quite historically, women with MS were actually discouraged from having pregnancies. And that was because doctors feared that um, MS might make their disease worse or pregnancy would make their disease worse. Uh, but back in 1998, there was this um, study that was published by a French group um, to which actually Jeanette, who's our next speaker, also contributed to. And what they um, did was they looked at the relapse rates of women planning pregnancy and then they looked at the relapse rates throughout pregnancy and they saw that relapse rates dropped to the lowest point in the third trimester and then saw a rebound in the first three months after delivery. And so this was really encouraging to neurologists because it showed that disease activity in MS decreased during pregnancy. And so therefore pregnancy was not something to be discouraged in women with MS if that was something that they wanted to do. Now, of course, this is historical data. It was published back in 1998, which means that the data was collected in the years before that. And so it's entirely possible that this data was what we say confounded um, or I guess a bit confused by the fact that it could have been that women with MS who had more mild disease were those that were attempting pregnancy back then and those with more active disease were discouraged. So we actually had a look at this recently because we wanted to see whether or not that same rule still holds true. And so this is what we found. So this is again data using um, the MS Base Registry. And we had a look at three different time points. We looked in the green at the pregnancies that were conceived before 2005. So before a lot of the medications that are available today were available. Um, back then we would have only have had the interferon beta and um, glutyrimia acetate medications. Then we looked at an intermediate time point between 2005 and 2010 where a number of um, MS medications started to become available. 
and then 2011 onwards. So that's what we call our modern era. And what we found, if you look here at this um, first part of the graph, in the year before conception, you can see that with the introduction of more effective therapies, the average relapse rate in women um, has decreased significantly over time. But we can also see with all of these three graphs is that during pregnancy, the relapse rates do decrease to be the lowest in the third trimester. And again, we still see this postpartum relapse rebound in the third, um, in the three months after delivery. So what we can see is that the historical data does hold up that relapse rates do reduce during pregnancy, uh, but we do still see disease reactivation thereafter. Okay, so what else should you know about pregnancy? Well, we know that some medications are safe to use in pregnancy um, and should be considered in women with highly active MS. But alternatively, um, if women are concerned about, say, exposing their um, baby to a disease-modifying therapy whilst they're pregnant, then um, there are other alternatives that can be considered, such as those that have really long-lasting effects. So, this is, I guess, a bit of a difficult um, topic when it comes to trying to give women with MS advice. And that's really because women are excluded from clinical trials of disease-modifying therapies. Um, I refer to disease-modifying therapies here as DMTs, and so you'll forgive me if I use that um, acronym quite a lot. Um, and so I guess often women, because there isn't a lot of good evidence with respect to using disease-modifying therapies in pregnancy, women are often faced with this really difficult choice between themselves, in other words, taking their DMT to control their MS activity, or conversely, you know, um, choosing their child, so they stop taking their DMT um, in order to become pregnant and breastfeed. And so we are lacking a lot of data when it comes to this. And so a lot of the information that we can give you today um, really relies on clinical registries such as MS Base. And the reason why we have information in these registries is because we've been collecting data on women who have sometimes um, unintentionally become pregnant or sometimes intentionally become pregnant on disease modifying therapies um, whilst being looked after by their neurologist. And so we monitor to see what happens to these women with MS through their pregnancy journey um, outside of the context of a clinical trial. And so what we um, found is that over the years, doctors are becoming more and more confident allowing their um, patients with MS to become pregnant on disease modifying therapies. So this is a um, study that we published a few years ago now in 2019, where we looked at women in the ms base registry and we identified over 1,500 pregnancies. And of these pregnancies, over 600 of them were exposed to a DMT um, at the time of conception. And on this bar graph here, you can see the same thing happening, that over the years in orange, we see the number of women or the proportion of women becoming pregnant on DMT. And you can see that this has increased gradually over time. And so these days we see that it's just over 60% of women that do fall pregnant uh, whilst taking a DMT. And that's really consistent um, globally across a lot of different studies that have been published. So what about which you know, DMTs can you get pregnant on? So the first thing that I do want to say is it's really important to have this discussion with your neurologist when you're considering which DMT you should be on, um, whether or not you want to be on one and so forth to see which one's safe. As I said before, there are some that have long lasting effects that you can take and then wait a number of months and become pregnant on those later. And so they include um, Ocrevus lumtrata and um, Mavenclad. And then there are others that are considered to be safe to fall pregnant on, but some of them you do have to stop at a particular point in time for neonatal safety, such as Tysabri. There are also other DMTs where we now have information from registry studies that it's not safe to become pregnant on those. And they include Obagio and Gelenia. If you do become pregnant on them, don't panic, talk to your clinical care team. Um, but we, if you are on them and you're planning on getting pregnant, then it's a good time to have a discussion to perhaps change therapies. So what do we know then about what happens to relapses in pregnancy? So I did show you this graph um, of the data that we've collected, particularly focusing on this purple or lavender graph here, where we show that today, in today's day and age, that there is a decrease in relapse rates throughout pregnancy, but it's not as obvious as it used to be back in the day. 
And part of that is because uh, disease activity is much better controlled these days than it was in the past, but there are other things at play here. And so we had a look at this and we broke it down by disease modifying therapy. And so this is a study that we actually just published this year. And although we weren't able to look at all of the disease modifying therapies that are available at the moment, we did have a look at a number of them. Now, I apologize, these um, abbreviations here are based on the non-commercial names. Um, Matt refers to natalizumab or Tysabri, Vin is short for Fingolimod or Jelenia, DMF is Tecfidera, Low refers to interferon beta and glutyramir acetate, and then obviously we've got none. Now, as I said, it's um, no longer encouraged to become pregnant on Jelenia, but this is actually relatively recent information that we have from registry studies. And so this data is based on women who became pregnant on Jelenia before we knew about the safety signals for it. And what I really wanted to focus on is um, this middle part here. So looking at the first, second and third trimesters of pregnancy, as I said, overall, um, most women actually have a reduction in the amount of disease activity they have during pregnancy, but this depends on which disease modifying therapy they were on um, before they became pregnant. And again, going back to this whole analogy that Susan spoke about, about the elastic band, there are a couple of therapies that we do know can um, result in relapse rebound or a quick reactivation of disease activity if you withdraw them and they include Jelenia and natalizumab. And so what we see here um, in this graph is exactly that. So in women who have discontinued these therapies after they've become pregnant, we see a rebound in disease activity and that rebound in disease activity tends to happen a period of time after they've discontinued. Now, this does not mean that you will have a relapse in pregnancy if you are on one of these therapies. And in fact, when we broke this down further, we found that women who continued natalizumab beyond the first trimester, at least in this study, did not experience any relapses during their pregnancy. So again, it's a time that you need to really um, communicate with your neurologist and your clinical care team to see what's right for you. But there is a risk these days of having a relapse in pregnancy if your disease is more highly active. And in our study, we found it was almost 12% of women who had a relapse during pregnancy. So what are the predictors of whether or not you might be at risk of having a um, relapse in pregnancy? Well, we know that relapse activity decreases with age. And so that the older you are when you are pregnant, the less likely you are to relapse. Now, we also heard from Susan that the older you are, the harder it is to become pregnant. So it's not really something that we have a lot of control over. Some of the things that we do have a little bit of control over is which disease modifying therapy, if any, you are using at the time of conception. And as I said, some of these disease modifying therapies, if they're continued into pregnancy, may actually reduce your risk if you have highly active disease. But again, it's a really important discussion to have with your clinical care team. Now, unfortunately, the other thing that we know is that relapse activity begets relapse activity, which is to say that if you have highly active MS, that you are somebody who relapses often, that also means that you are potentially at higher risk of having a relapse in pregnancy. And so it's really important to maintain those close relationships with your clinical care team during that period. Okay, so what about postpartum? Well, we also um, think that women should be aware that there is this higher risk of having a postpartum relapse and that all women are at risk of having a postpartum relapse, even those that are on lower efficacy therapies or no therapies. So this is looking at this same graph again, but now moving across to this three months postpartum. And you can see that there is this spike in relapse activity. Now, when we measure this, we're not just looking at comparing, say, which medication you were on previously compared to those uh, women who are not on therapy or are on low efficacy therapies. We actually look all the way back here into this 12 month preconception period and we compare what is your relapse activity here after delivery compared to a year ago, for example. And so we can see that, um, again, there is a spike in relapse activity but it's also more likely to happen in women with more highly active disease or those that had been managed on more effective therapies. And so previously in that historical study that I showed you earlier, we saw that it was about 30% of women used to have a postpartum relapse rebound. 
these days it's just under 14 percent and that's because of the way that we've been able to change uh, the clinical care of women with MS. Now, I think this is something that does not get a lot of attention, but is something that we do need to think about. And that's not just looking at women that have had live births, but we also need to consider what the effect of having um, a pregnancy end in, um, by way of abortion or uh, miscarriage or a stillbirth. And we need to consider whether or not these women are also potentially at risk of having a post-pregnancy um, relapse. And we looked at that again in our recent study, and we found that almost 10% of women who have a miscarriage or a termination are also at risk of having a relapse in those three months after the pregnancy ends. And another study published relatively recently as well suggested that women who have an elective termination are potentially at slightly higher risk of having a relapse compared to women who have a spontaneous miscarriage. Now it's really hard to know what the reason for that is and it might also be stress related as Susan alluded to where we know that um, stress can also be a factor that um, impacts whether or not you have a relapse. So it's just something to be aware of and I know that it can be a difficult thing to talk about but again I think it's important to be in touch with the clinical care team um, if you do have a miscarriage or a termination just to make sure that you're being um, monitored just um, in case for a postpartum relapse. So what can you do to reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse? Well, again, um, we know that reinitiating with your DMT um, soon after delivery is something that can reduce postpartum relapse risk. But we also need to balance that with the choice of which DMT should be reinitiated. So um, again, our recent research showed that women who reinitiated with a highly effective disease modifying therapy soon after delivery, so we're talking about Tysabri, Ocrevus or Lemtrada, they were able to reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse by almost 83%. Um, and those who reinitiated with an injectable um, therapy, so uh, your capaxones and your interferons, were also able to reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse of about um, 60%. And that sort of makes sense in terms of, you know, uh, we know that Tysabri and Ocrevus and Lemtrada are more highly effective than the others. But again, it, they may not be the right medication for an individual. Now, there's also evidence that some of the oral therapies might also reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse. But the numbers that we had for that study were too low for us to make any sort of um, firm conclusions. Um, now we also know that uh, breastfeeding may also be beneficial in terms of preventing a postpartum relapse. And again, in our same study, um, we found that breastfeeding was able to reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse by about 40%. Um, so when we talk about exclusive breastfeeding in this context, what we mean is breast milk and any medication that the baby may need, but no mixed formula feeding. Now, you can also see here that breastfeeding might reduce the risk of having a postpartum relapse by about 40%. So if breastfeeding is something that you want to do and you're able to do, you should certainly feel comfortable doing it and be encouraged to do it. But at the same time, if that's not something that you want to do or something that you're not able to do, you shouldn't feel bad about that either. Um, we also know that it's not as effective as going back onto a disease modifying therapy. So again, it's really important to have these conversations, work out what's right for you, what you think is right for your baby and what works in general. And also there are the considerations of which disease modifying therapy you can use when you're breastfeeding. And so again, we know that there are some DMTs that are okay to use when you're breastfeeding and some which are not safe and there are others for which we still don't have sufficient evidence. And so this is a bit of a summary taken from a number of papers that have been written by a number of authors from around the world. And so when we're talking about transfer to breast milk, what we mean is that the researchers have actually obtained breast milk samples from breastfeeding mothers and they've measured the amount of these medications in the breast milk and they've shown that whilst they might transfer into the breast milk, the levels are really low um, and so they're safe to use. Um, and also in terms of safe to use, what's also happened is that the researchers then also follow the developmental milestones of the babies and in the context of Tysabri and Ocrevus, even taken some blood samples from the babies to make sure that their um, bloods are okay. And so these studies would suggest that these um, medications are okay to use when you're breastfeeding. But again, super important to talk to your doctor and um, nurse about it. 
Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to touch upon was that you should also know that pregnancy does not increase your risk of your disease worsening. And so when we looked at um, our data again, we found that uh, less than 6% of women who had a pregnancy have any sort of measurable increase in neurological disability in the year after birth. Now, previously it was published that it was about 13% of women, but again, doctors are getting so much better at managing um, women with MS through reinitiating disease modifying therapies and so forth. So uh, these short term effects are getting better and better, or short term outcomes are getting better and better for women with MS. In terms of the long term um, effects of pregnancy on um, MS, um, again, a, public, a study that we published. Um, a few years ago, um, looking at over 1,800 women showed that if anything, pregnancy might be beneficial um, and that women who had pregnancies accumulated less long-term disability than those women who did not have pregnancies. Um, and at the moment, we are working to try and understand this a bit better to find out, is it to do with the timing of when you have a pregnancy? Is it to do with the age you are when you have a pregnancy and so forth? So we're still doing a lot of research to try and understand this a little bit better, but it does look like pregnancy could be beneficial. Um, and if nothing else, there's another study that was published by a Spanish group that found that pregnancy had no impact whatsoever. So it didn't make um, your MS worse, but it didn't make your MS better either. It just had no impact. Your disease um, kept going the way that it was meant to go. So this was in women with relapsing remitting MS. But what about women who have secondary progressive or primary progressive MS? And this is another area where there's very little data, but where our research team is working to try and get more evidence. This is a study uh, that we presented at a conference a few years ago now, um, looking at women with primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. And so what we did here is we plotted um, along this time frame here, women's disability scores or EDSS scores over time. And so to the left of the graph, we have their disability scores before their pregnancy. This gray bit here represents the pregnant period. And then these bars to the right, uh, or these lines to the right, sorry, uh, after pregnancy, their disability scores. And so what you can see is that it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some women who had progressive MS can, uh, got better after their pregnancy. Some women remained stable and a handful of women got worse. So in other words, if you have progressive MS, again, there's no evidence to suggest that pregnancy will make uh, your disease worse or better, that it will just keep tracking the way it was going to track. So my couple of um, take home messages. Uh, pregnancy planning should start early on for women and also men. Um, and which therapies might be appropriate to use when trying to conceive and for women during pregnancy and thereafter. Relapse rates might reduce um, for women um, during their pregnancy and I know some women with MS feel fantastic when they're pregnant. Now we know though that um, pregnancy is still a time of disease activity for some women as I showed you it's about 12% of women who may still have a relapse during their pregnancy. Exclusive breastfeeding might reduce the risk of postpartum relapse, so you should um, feel comfortable breastfeeding if that's something that you want to do. Um, and rapid reinitiation with the disease modifying therapy can prevent postpartum relapse activity, but again, you have to balance that with which is the right medication based on whether or not you want to breastfeed. But again, as I said, be reassured, pregnancy will not make your MS worse. So on that note, I just want to thank my researcher, all of whom are pictured here. But most importantly, I also want to thank all the women with MS who have generously shared their pregnancy stories with us so that we can um, do the research that we're doing. We're actually doing a study now where we've interviewed almost 5,000 women with MS about their pregnancy histories um, so that we can hopefully inform you even better. And finally, again, there are so many other people that are involved in this research, including MS Australia's uh, Jodie Hartson um, and Jeanette Lechner-Scott, who's going to talk to you next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vilia. That was just so insightful, getting all that data from the MS base. It's really good to see that, you know, these studies are being undertaken to help people with MS and pregnancy. 
um, and you know just that information on all the disease modifying therapies before during and after pregnancy I, I know a lot of people will, will you know use that information and it's really great so thank you um, next, I'd like to introduce our third speaker. We have Associate Professor Jeanette Lechner-Scott talking about future women's health research. Jeanette is a con conjoint professor of the Hunter Medical Research Institute, University of Newcastle. She leads the MS clinic in the John Hunter Hospital, caring for over 1,000 patients with MS in the area. She has an intense interest in how MS impacts cognition and is also on MS Limited's board of directors. Now, Jeanette is unable to be with us live today, but if you have any questions for Jeanette, uh, please type them in the questions section. Thank you, Adriana, for this lovely introduction. And thank you for listening to me uh, talking about pregnancy, which is a very important uh, topic for an specialist. And I'll tell you why. So we, you already heard from Susan Eckland and Vilja how important it is to plan pregnancy. And you know that it is a time for difficult decisions to make. Um, on one side is you want to plan a family, you want to have as many kids as you want. Uh, we have heard from Vilja that it might improve your long-term outcome. But then it, you might have to risk to interrupt your treatment. And if you don't, there's a potential risk to your fetus, to your baby. Sometimes um, artificial in, uh, reproductive technology might be associated with an increased relapse risk. So it is really hard to make these decisions and what to do and the evidence is actually quite scarce. If you look over the time, so in the general population, this decision is not that easy either. You can see here on the left graph um, that the chance to fall pregnant is 25% if you're young in your early 20s, but it uh, goes down quite rapidly uh, and if you're in the late 30s, it's less than 10, and late 30s or 40s, it's less than 10% chance um, in a month to fall pregnant. And uh, if you're here in the mid or late 40s, it's going to at zero. Despite that, and all the planning that we always do, there's still 51% of Australian women have unplanned pregnancies. So, that is to be taken into account and also that overall in the whole world our fertility is decreasing. Um, the green factor is how many you need to have to maintain a population and red is especially if you fall below two, uh, your population will retract. Some will say oh that's good we're overpopulating the planet anyway but it's a um, it's twofold because this is only happening in the developed world, whereas in the uh, underdeveloped world, this is not happening. So there is less people sharing wealth and more people sharing poverty. So the decision when is the best time to fall pregnant is not only uh, related to fertility, but in women with MS, you have this in the back of your mind. Is my disability increasing? If I'm still as fit and well as I am now, is that not the best time to have my babies where there really is a high demand on my uh, energy levels, uh, on my physical activity? I mean, you try to run after a toddler when uh, you have leg spasticity. So we know that MS is significantly impacting family planning. There was a recent study published in uh, Frontiers of Neurology where 332 women in America, UK, Germany, Spain, France and Italy were interviewed uh, if their disease has impacted their family planning. 21% answered that they changed the timing of having children according to their disease needs. 14% did 
decided completely against having children. And unfortunately, and this is something that uh, we really need to change, 78% did not discuss family planning before choosing their disease-modifying therapy. How do we currently address the issue? There is uh, UK guidelines that were published in 2019 by Ruth Dobson and collaborators. And the main message that she wants to get across is that all women of childbearing age should have pregnancy counselling by their MS specialist and by their um, obstetrician. Women should be advised to discuss pregnancy with their specialist before trying to conceive because there is some planning involved. And generally, prescribers should consider pregnancy when prescribing the DMT. So there is a few guidelines in UK that some are based on evidence and others are not. Um, for example, that uh, uh, there's no effect of MS on fertility is, I think, still something of debate. There's some publication that say there is and others that there isn't. Um, I think we all agree that we shouldn't really defer disease-modifying therapy um, for family planning, but we should include it in the family planning. But there's little evidence around it either. It's a... Um, it's an advice from expert uh, with little evidence to guide us. Um, we should consider the effect of exposure in males. Uh, pregnancy, as you've heard from Vilja, does definitely not affect your long-term outcome negatively. And relapse risk uh, is something that needs to be discussed. Uh, it can still occur and Vilja has allergic to that as well during the pregnancy, maybe more so now than previously, before we had disease-modifying therapy, therapies, but it definitely is a risk after you had your baby. I still get many phone calls of obstetrician that ask me about management and delivery. So having MS is not automatically making you a high-risk pregnancy. Uh, and yes, you can have steroids during pregnancy, but it can have negative effects as well. We highly recommend the use of vitamin D. And MS itself should also not uh, change the decision that you make about the mode of delivery. Uh, epidural or diazepam for spasticity during labor is recommended. We also encourage to breastfeed, and you need to discuss if your therapy is suitable for breastfeeding or if we should pose. That is something that is a very individual decision, uh, how active your disease is and how quickly after delivery you need to start a therapy again. It's, you know, different symptomatic treatments are sometimes more dangerous uh, for pregnancies than the disease-modifying therapy. But all of this uh, requires very close uh, discussion and uh, intensive discussions with your neurologist and obstetrician. But also we need more evidence. So Bruce Dobson went ahead and tested these guidelines and how much they are accepted in the UK. So 14% of UK neurology consultants, and there's a hell of a lot more than in Australians, 958, lead an MS clinic. And only, unfortunately, 79 of them answered this survey. What was really shocking is that only one reported that they have a joint clinic, and this is MS specialists, with obstetrician or midwife. Only 11% still defer DMT in a newly diagnosed woman if she wants to conceive. But there was a quite a wide range of decision making um, in MS specialists in the UK, despite the guidelines. And that is because there's a lack of evidence to base your guidelines on. So what are the questions that need to be answered? We still don't know how pregnancy affects 
the long-term outcome of MS. We've looked retrospectively in our large databases. We do not know how does having MS affect the chance of falling pregnant. I have been through many failed attempts with uh, my patients that want to fall pregnant. Was it only age? Was it the treatment? We do not know. How does being on treatment affect my chance of falling pregnant? This is something that constantly changed. What we have evidence for is better interferon on, uh, and clotirumai acetate because that has been around for decades, but not the newer therapies. And ultimately, if I don't fall pregnant, uh, how does fertility treatment affect my MS? Especially artificial reproductive technology is something that needs more evidence. There was an early paper here in 2012, a French paper, um, that described an increased risk of relapse with gonadotropin agonists here compared to antagonists. We're not quite sure if that was because this mode of increasing uh, your ovulation is less successful uh, than the antagonist, which is the most commonly used uh, uh, mode now here in Australia. Or is it the stress uh, of failed cycles that uh, uh, let you have an increased relapse rate? So if um, one of our collaborate, uh, collaborators, uh, Rali Bove, has uh, published a meta-analysis to look at all uh, the effects of ART on relapse rates, and here green is before and red is after, and in all the publications, not that many, um, here five showed a substantial increase in relapse rate than prior of trying to fall pregnant. Only the American study showed a decrease. And if she did, uh, once she did a meta-analysis, um, there's still an increased risk. But this is based only on 220 pregnancies. So a meta-analysis only based on 220 pregnancies. So that needs to be improved. Therefore, we are planning two projects. I do talk about that because they're very much planned, uh, but we do not yet have funding for these projects. They require a substantial amount of funding. And should we not be successful this year, I hope some of you might be able to help us and assist to get enough money for these projects to go through. So on one side, we want to look what assisted reproductive technology does to your MS. And on the other side, we want to see, is there a factor of your disease or your treatment that affects your fertility? Uh, we currently are already collecting retrospective data with interviews of our women uh, based on uh, especially on our MS database that Vilja has spoken already. So we want to know how many pregnancies you had, at what time point in your disease course, how many miscarriages, how many used artificial reproductive therapy, and how many relapses did you have in relation to your failed pregnancy or successful pregnancy, and how did that affect your MS outcome? So this is a study currently in process. Uh, we have, just to show you a snippet of it, uh, collected 103 uh, uh, questionnaires so far. Uh, and if you looked at the median age at first uh, delivery was in our cohort in uh, the Hunter, 26. In the general population, uh, that was 29. Um, Preterm delivery was only 10%, 11%, which is about the same as the general population. It's actually surprising. Uh, women with MS had less C-sections. Uh, the medium birth rate is within that of the normal population. Um, about the same rate of people who are breastfeeding, maybe slightly less. This is not statistically significantly different, but um, 
you know, some of uh, the women with the MS would probably have started treatment again and therefore not breastfed. Um, the rate of second and third child uh, is not much different from the general population either. I mean, I think every woman is brave that has four or more children, and that might be why it's only 6% in our population. Now, the, it seems to be a slight different in the difficulty of falling pregnant, but again, we need to uh, look at the larger cohort that has been collected already. And it seems to be a higher rate that actually access uh, artificial reproductive technology, although it is very hard to find the true data in the general population and needs to be, you know, extrapolated of the data that we have and how many people are there in a, a New South Wales women that potentially would want to fall pregnant. So once we have these, uh, um, all the women that ever had uh, artificial reproductive therapy, we want to ask them, how was your experience? Did you have any advice? Uh, was there any advice given to you? What treatment did you receive, especially what type of ART? And how did your MS travel during this period? What were your stress and fatigue levels? And we will ask you, we include your advice in that or derive our suggestions from your advice, how we can improve this process, because I don't think it's well at traveling well at the moment. But a big part of fund that is the major funding um, that we require is the prospective data collection. Uh, you have heard that even the meta analysis could analysis could only base, you know, multiple centers uh, collect 220. And therefore, we um, want to collaborate with nine centers around Australia, not only in Newcastle, but uh, three centers in Melbourne, Perth, Hobart, Liverpool, Adelaide and Brisbane. So every major MS clinic is uh, on this list. And we work with Raleigh Bodu in the States. Uh, we want to work together with uh, IVF Australia, and we have submitted that plan uh, together with them. We want to collect three cohorts, women with MS with fertility issues, planning a pregnancy, women with MS without fertility issues, planning pregnant, uh, pregnancy, and healthy controls that are planning a pregnancy because, you know, you need to compare. So the planned outcomes is we want to see how long it takes. And that is the only evidence that we can ever show if there is an increase or decrease in fertility in women with MS. How long does it take our women in MS to fall pregnant compared to uh, other women at the same age group? We also want to identify potential sources for infertility in MS. We'll therefore collect at several stages hormone levels, uh, especially um, anti-malarian uh, hormone, which is uh, a level of fertility uh, measurement. Uh, we want to look at the pregnancy outcome. We want to immune phenotype because uh, you might be aware that your immune cells change quite dramatically during your pregnancy. And uh, one theory why pregnancy could be protective for MS is um, that you learn more tolerance during the pregnancy. And that is one reason maybe uh, why women are more likely to have MS because they plan to have pregnancies and they need to learn this auto tolerance during the pregnancy. These are theories that need to be proven. We also want to include epigenetics in our study. That looks very dark here, the grim age, but you might have heard uh, of the epigenetic clock which is comparing chronological age with epigenetic age. Now this clock has been 
evolved from Harvard clock to now Grim age, which predicts your overall cause mortality. So positive factors like healthy food intake or exercise would reduce your age acceleration, whereas infections, stress, um, you know, obesity or other diseases and cancer risk, gender will increase your age acceleration. Now we've looked at that in uh, our CD4 cell epigenetic data. We were one of the first to show that there is a difference between MS and controls in their epigenetic uh, data. And we, that was then confirmed uh, by a cohort in Sweden and also in Norway. And we combined this data and we found that with the CRIM age, there is a statistically significant age acceleration in MS compared to healthy control. What does that have to do with pregnancy? Well, this was a recent study that showed here again how important the epigenetic age is. It's very closely correlated with uh, your chronological age. So far so that even before and after pregnancy, you can see that they move up. But they looked at the immu immunogenetic uh, epigenetic uh, path and they saw that comparing before and after in your CD8 cells, you find that you get younger. So your biological age is decreasing with pregnancy. This is in the general population. But there's also a study that uh, um, it was published in the Brisbane group with Pamela McCoom uh, that showed that parity is associated uh, with uh, epigenetic changes. So the more uh, children you have, the more likely you have epigenetic changes. And pregnancy reduces the frequency of relapses in MS, and parity has also been an official effect on long-term MS disease outcome. So this was a combination of gene expression and methylation. So what does that mean for me? This is studies are supposed to provide evidence if pregnancy improves your long-term prognosis of MS, when to best fall pregnant, and what to do with your treatment when you plan pregnancy. We hope to provide guidelines how to manage pregnancy in women with MS, how to best approach infertility issues, and we do now, but definitely with evidence behind us, suggest multidisciplinary approach to pregnancy management in MS. So to summarize, as you might have heard now several times, pregnancy planning is important in women with MS. Advice is needed from neurologist and obstetrician. There's a paucity of evidence and we need these studies to go ahead to provide you with the evidence. And therefore, it is very important to plan this prospective study, uh, which includes all confounders, all the symptoms that Susan has uh, talked about, your symptoms of MS, your fatigue level, that might impede your chances of falling pregnant. And therefore we need blood collection, look at hormone levels, uh, immune cell profiling and epigenetics. Thank you for your attention and I'm keen to see your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That was just such an insightful summary of well, everything that you've highlighted and the importance of, you know, uh, pregnancy planning on your MS journey. And I look forward to the future research that uh, is to be conducted. Um, I'd like to thank all our guest speakers, Susan, Vilia, and Jeanette. Um, you know, it's given us, uh, you know, 
people with MS who are looking at family planning, um, the insight on you know fertility issues that we may be faced with, um, issues fertility issues and MS and other ways on how to better manage our MS during and after pregnancy. Um, I guess the importance on pregnancy planning on your MS journey, um, it, it, it's really there and to connect with the, you know, the experts around you, including your doctors, your, your obstetricians, your neurologists um, and your MS support is the first base. So. Um, it's, it's really, really great to have this information um, brought to us. Um, I know that, you know, this, this information, now that I've already had my family, but this information is such a, would have been such a great tool as a first base step. So I thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, thank you to everyone for participating in Women's Health Week. Um, if you've got any of your questions, uh, our team will follow them up with you across the week. And we also encourage you to contact your trusted health professional if you'd like to understand the best approach to treatment management for your individual circumstances. Uh, we do have quite a lot of services across the board. If you'd like to access uh, the MS nurses, peer support and NDI NDIS services, please contact your state or territory organisation through the numbers or emails that we've listed here on your screen. For more details on the other Women's Health Week events, please visit MS Australia's Community Program Hub um, and you'll find that at msaustralia.org.au. Um, and also to stay on top of the latest research, advocacy and news, follow MS Australia on Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, also, for your updates on MS services, uh, just follow your state or your territory page, which we'll have up on the screen. And finally, we ask you to please stay on after this webinar to complete a short survey, as your feedback is really important to us and will be used to improve our services. Um, once again, I'd just like to extend my gratitude to the speakers and my thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a really great program. So thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.